Hey, so I was just thinking, I talked about Jesus, I talked about many people that I've known who I've served with who have died, and um, there's a bunch more that are still, haven't come home yet, they're still dying out there. Um, on the streets, almost for veterans, this is through the skyrocketing through the roof. It's it's insane, and they're um, they need to come home again, you know. Um, living on the streets and never being able to come home again is almost if bad, almost as bad, if not worse than dying somewhere strange and coming home in a bag as you are home but you feel like you're in a strange land and I was thinking I, I need to start talking about remembering certain people in my life folks, military and personal family and friends. And uh, kind of wanted to start out with Admiral Borda. So I came in the Navy in December 1994. Late entry program for I think like three years. <laughs> um, my brother was, had joined four years before that and um, my mom served and my father served and my grandfather served and you know after me my two cousins end up serving not in the Navy or Marine Corps surprisingly but um, they went they went astray um, and we were boat people but um, they did what they had to do and um, surprisingly my um, my one cousin joined the army and worked on hovercrafts and spent most of his time on the water and and the other one um, was a tank mechanic and now he's an amazing welder and has a great family and they're both married and they served their country proudly and both retired um, and like me you could probably say medically retired because probably wasn't a chance we were going to be able to to do anything more for the military because we were so broken but I want to talk about so 1994 boot camp a school so I went to boot camp in Chicago um, basically um, the day after Christmas I, I, I reported for duty in Chicago and um, then um, I did that. I, I did the Christmas and New Year's through the through a very cold winter in Chicago, and from there, um, and then boot camp was. I wrestled my whole life, and my wrestling coach was a maniac when it came to endurance and strength and how leverage and body position is great but to have that core strength all the way through you and he was teaching that way back in the 80s and you know now it's everywhere you know your core all that stuff and he was teaching that you know way back in the 80s and um side tangent so boot camp was kind of to me was kind of a joke plus i me and my mom didn't have a very good relationship per se as I always wanted to, I wanted to get out so I've always wanted to get out and, and just and find my way and when I did I um I really found my way and I found my way back to the beginning and that's God but so after that I went to Gulfport Mississippi um for EOA school probably one of the I think the second to last class there um, before they all moved to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Um, and they started cross-training with the Air Force and Army. And I think the Marine Corps, but I'm not really sure. Um, like I said, I was... When I had joined, 
I remember in A school, one of the our female instructors was EO2, and um, she, um, that's equipment operator, second class, if, for anybody who doesn't know. Anyways, she was super excited because women could go into battalions now. And it was shortly after we had just gotten rid of the Greens, and probably 10 years before that, we finally started shaving. I mean, CBs were allowed to have beards. And, um, so anyways, I do that school, Gulfport, Mississippi, get in a lot of trouble. I'll tell you what, Gulfport, Mississippi, Spring Bank, near New Orleans, a young, dumb, full of, you know what, and being able to drink at 18, yeah, in Mississippi, you could, out on town, you could drink at 18. If you're old enough to die for your country, you're old enough to have a beer. And I'm all for that. But, I'll tell you what, it's a recipe for trouble. And believe me, I did a fair share of my trouble. And as a matter of fact, my one, my one hand, that knuckle has been destroyed and that bone has been crooked since A school, 1995. <laughs> um, but I also, I got to see a lot of cool stuff too when I was there, you know. Saw, um, saw the Eagles, the Hellfreezes over tour, um, and I got to get thrown off a balcony with a buddy of mine, um, in this place called Wet n' Wild down in Gulfport, Mississippi, uh, Biloxi, sorry, right next to it. In, in Biloxi, and um, you go in there, I think it was Saturdays, and it was penny drafts, so you paid a penny for a beer until the first person peed, and then it went the regular price. So it was like this manly thing to see how many beers you could get in before somebody went pee, and usually the first person to go pee uh, was me and Chucky, and we ended up getting our asses thrown out of there. And uh, it was right on the beach, and anyways, that was a long walk back to the base. So from there, they, they ship us from Chicago to Mississippi. They give you a list of all these places they think you might want to go when you're um, getting ready to graduate from, from A school. And it's a, a wish list, and it's the your top five, the top five places you want to go. And um, the most of them are just like, and then they give you a list of places you can go. And for some odd reason, in number five, I, I put Alaska. I was like, how cool would it be to go to Alaska? Well, guess what? That's where me and two of my buddies went. Equipment operators, CBs, m Marines with construction skills, and um, just a bunch of rednecks with highly trained rednecks with guns. And uh, the CBs was a, a weird world, man. And I get thrown into Adak, Alaska. Now, you go to that fly into Anchorage, right? And then you get on a plane, a seven hour flight from Anchorage to Adak through. For what me, my limited flight experience at that time, was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Because I had no control whatsoever. And I had no idea what was going on. Because I heard of turbulence, but when you're dropping up and down like that for seven hours, and it's not one of those super padded planes of the, you know, you can watch movies and stuff. No. This is a cargo plane with a little bit of a place for people to fly in so yeah you fly in there and then uh, you think you're gonna go do cool construction stuff and stuff like that and then somebody swoops you up from the fire department he sticks you in a truck and he said you're here on open orders you're working for the fire department now and I was like what 
Well, it ended up being the coolest thing I ever did in my life, you know. I, I helped save like 100 people. Um, I resuscitated three on my own. Um, I did hazmat training. I did all kinds of both airfield and structural fire training. And it was every day. And, it, and we worked uh, 48 on, 24 off. I did that for a year plus solid. And every day we had off, we just partied. We were, we were firefighters, we were Seabees. And I remember the man I'm getting to, Admiral Borda, Michael Borda. And he was the, one of those guys that we all wanted to be, you know. And that they were all so worried about, um, so they, you know, they briefed us and briefed us because he wanted to ride in the truck. And he was happy to see that there were Seabees working for the fire department because he he loved CBs and um and they're telling us on and i happened to be the driver that day uh, on the crew um i usually swapped it out with my other buddy chucky but anyways so they're they're briefing us all the stuff i'm in the fire department i am man you couldn't get my you know i was always ready for everything I was like drink more party more fornicate smoke more cigarettes run more miles do more push-ups carry more dummies man we used to carry that dummy everywhere I remember every time you think you could rest in the fire department it was bam some of the like crew chief would call out you know get your gear on hard stand hard stand or we got a structural fire and then where they'd have the dispatcher call out some something and it was like it was it wasn't like oh man another training exercise it was like oh man they got me when i wouldn't think this is possible you know and you you wanted to better your time before you wanted to be that you were just like oh this is awesome because you knew that that drive to be there as fast as you could and, and think on your feet as fast as you could and just have all this testosterone just pumping through your... Anyways, they stick me in a truck with this guy. And anybody that knows me, I love to drive fast. and But I don't drive fast much on the streets. You know, and for the most part, I always keep it 10 5. So, anywhere on a road, try to keep the max of 5 over. Anywhere on a highway, 10 over a little bit more sometimes, depending on where you're at. And um, anywhere else, um, housing, comp housing complexes, apartments, grocery stores, just keep it there at it or a little below i mean there, there's no guarantee that you you don't need to do 25 in a, in a school zone or you could do less <clears throat> i mean isn't that the whole point of it anyways anyways so admiral borda amazing amazing dude you know because he he rose from the enlisted class and went all the way to admiral and he got in the truck with us and normally and then normally it was one other guy um from his crew like command master chief or or one of his uh, his aides you know when we were doing something training like like hey i'm going out to a hard stand and or just what the navy's money was paying for for these fire trucks and uh <laughs> I'm giving him a ride around the airfield. And he had already said he didn't want anybody to come with me, with him, except for me, the fireman, and anybody else from the crew, except for the crew chief that wanted to go. And he hooks our crew chief was a, a third class, and, you know, the other crew chief, I think, was a second class before I ended up becoming my own crew chief and then running training. But and he. He said, no, I, I, I want to talk to these boys in private. And we're out there driving around and, you know, telling them the calls and we're crossing over the airfield and stuff like that. And he's like, 
he turns to me and he says, he asked me, um, he said, what's your first name? And I said, Michael. And he said, my name's Michael as well. And he said, now that nobody's here, drive this thing like you would drive it for training for a real fire. Because that's what I want to see. I want to see you guys in action. I don't want to see you guys kissing my ass to make it look like you're doing more than you're, than, you know, than you actually are. So how do you do this and all this? And I, and I took off and that's where he really explained to me the Seaman Admiral program. And I never heard a bad word about him in the military. I mean, everybody that I knew at that time, because I, I came in probably, you know, I think it was actually probably pretty early on in his, um, as being joint chief staff. Uh, no, he was chief of naval operations. And then, um, and then I heard that he, um, he killed himself or that's what they say happened. And it's tragic because he never, for one, never served in an actual conflict. Um, not that that much matters for what that he had done for the military. So under his charge, people had fought in the war. So the president doesn't fight in the war anymore. George Washington did. <laughs> and, um, but he commanded men that had fought in wars and conflicts and that to me is all I would need because he, he started to see uh, the bigger need for the enlisted class to be on the same playing ground as an officer. So be able to, to learn what it was like to be the grunt, to be the military guy, this, the, be the guy taking the orders, be the guy on the front line actually doing the work. Not saying that officers and stuff like that don't do the work, but the Seaman Admiral program allowed that for at the time, especially with the late eighties, early nineties, we weren't really in a war. There was the Gulf thing, but we were still trying to survive as Seabees. And he was a big advocate for it. And he was a big advocate for the men. And I'm sure he had great fondness for the officers and anybody who served, but the, the real people are the E1 to, I would say, to, to E6. The, the real guys out there still putting it down and working and, and leading from the front with their troops. And, um, that's very powerful if somebody is also able to study enough, get a college degree, do enough other stuff to warrant being awarded the seaman to, to actually make it to Admiral like he did. And I want to remember him even though he didn't die in a foreign war. He, um, he died for this country and he died for the Navy and he died for me because I was a CB and, um, I want to put a shout out to Michael Gregory, Michael Borda and, um, the only chief of Naval operations I, I ever remembered where I wasn't being told I had to remember. So he is a good man in my book and I don't know what he did wrong or what caused him to do what he did or whether he did it or not. 
he did something for me. And I'm sure he did a lot for a bunch of other people. So may God bless. Try to find one to remember. And then do your research. Maybe you find out that you owe a lot more to that person than you thought. May God bless. Stay strong. Keep pushing on to him. Jesus is the way.